to Season 2, Episode 2 of our TechNet, sponsored by Southern Four Wheel Drive Association, or brought to you by Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Southern Four Wheel Drive here continuing to uh, commit, continuing with their commitment on education. So tonight, with, with our Episode 2, we told you that our whole Season 2 was going to be about tools. So tonight, we are here to talk to you about tools. We've got some awesome information some great examples of some awesome tools brought to you from SunX Tools. But tonight we are here at Clemson Four Wheel Center. 50 years in business, right? Since 1970. So they, now let's talk about our other sponsors. BF Goodrich, right? Woo! More tires. Also, Warren gave us a bunch of really cool stuff to give away this year. Um, so we're really excited about that as well. So we've got Chris here. He's been uh, with SunX Tools for a while. You guys saw Cole when we talked about suspension. I'm going to let them kind of take the lead um, and then help them with the questions here towards the end. But stay tuned, guys, because tons of great information. I learned a lot about tools. I didn't realize that there was so much science that really went into making a wrench, right? There's a ton behind it, and Chris is going to share some of that with us. All right. Glad to be here. Um, excited. <clears throat> Hopefully we can teach you guys something. Uh, we're going to cover several different tool types. Um, you know, I'll talk about how, how they're built, why they're built the way they are. And then uh, Cole's going to give you some real life, you know, experiences with what he's done on the trail, uh, the proper usage. And uh, we've got a Jeep here, so we're going to kind of show you some examples of um, how to make these fixes. So you want to make sure that you're carrying the correct tools for your vehicle, the correct socket sizes. So Cole and Chris tonight will actually give you some examples to put into this toolbox so that you can carry. And this is a Clemson four-wheel four -wheel center exclusive piece, right? So make sure you visit Clemson four-wheel center if you want to get one. All right, so the first thing I'm going to cover is chrome versus impact, right? So we've got two main types of sockets. Um, there's different depths, there's different styles, um, there's, you know, for different kinds of bolts on your rig. So the first thing I want to hit on is proper usage, right? So we have an impact and we have a chrome socket. One thing that we never want to do is use a chrome socket with an impact wrench. Uh, the reason for that is that this chrome socket is made out of chrome vanadium, so it's very brittle. Now it's thinner. So, you know, in certain situations, you do need a thinner socket to access, you know, down in a recess or down in a hole for the bolt. <clears throat> but again, it's brittle. So you're running a safety risk if you use this. You know, usually you're at home with an impact wrench. Not many of us have impacts on the trail necessarily. Um, so with an impact socket, it is chromoly. So chromoly is a little softer. It's more flexible. So a lot of people think that, you know, an impact is stronger because it's harder. But that's not the case. So it's softer. So it, it gives a little bit um, as that tool is impacting and you're less likely to, to crack or break this style socket than you are chrome. Um, you know, there's different there's different depths of sockets like we have here. We have a deep half inch socket where we kind of have a, a standard size chrome socket here. There's shallow. There's mid depth. Um, you know, this kit that Clemson's doing, you know, Cole, what's, what's your preferred depth on the trail? Um, honestly, if you're trying to save weight, uh, you know, you're going to use more of a deep well socket because it'll fit in both places. Most of the time, you're mm -hmm. going to have those times where you have to have a shallow, uh, especially in like the engine bay, there's tight spots. So once again, vehicle specific to what you're working on and, you know, depends on what happens really. Yeah, that's a great point. So the other, you know, the other thing you see with the socket is a 12 point versus six point. So this is important because there's two different style bolts. There's 12 point bolts and there's six point bolts. Yep. So that's, you know, as it, you know, as it sounds, six points and 12 points. So we've got examples here. Um, this is a typical 12 point. I don't know what, was this a head bolt or something? I don't uh, know. That's actually a bolt. Okay. okay. Here, I'll, I'll bring it closer to you. So you can see with this 12 point socket, you get excellent engagement. So you want, you know, the more surface contact you have between the socket and the fastener, the less likely you are to round something off, strip something, strip your socket, strip your bolt and have a problem there. When you are 
you know, using these tools, you want to make sure that you're using the proper point for the proper fastener. You know, your your 12 point will go in a six point bolt. Your six point will not go in a 12 point bolt. So it kind of helps you there. But when you do use a 12 point socket on a six point bolt, you're very likely to strip the bolt, right? You can yeah. you can round the fastener and then you're really in trouble because now you can't get that out. And um you, you know, know, inner pinch on the trail, if that's the only socket you have, you know, I mean, you got to use the true, you have. true, yeah. But, you know, in ideal situations, you do want to try to use the proper socket, and hopefully somebody else in your group has the proper one if you mm -hmm. don't. And that, you know, that's important, like like Mike has said, you know, you want to have the correct sockets for your rig, whatever that is. So, you know, always before you're going out, check everything over, make sure you have what you need, make sure if you do have a 12 point, you know, fastener that you think is susceptible to break that you have a 12 point socket to fit, to fit that fastener. Yeah, so maybe if you're on the trail and you know that you have a hard to reach place, right? One of the things uh, Cole brought up earlier for the chrome sockets was some wheels have really uh, hard to access lug nuts where you pretty much have to have the thin wall chrome socket to get in there. So maybe you carry that specific size but then you carry your full set of impacts to use, right? Because they're going to hold up um, very well. Like Chris was saying, you know, they are softer, but they are designed for kind of those high impact scenarios. Just carry enough of these to fit in those hard to reach areas like, uh, you know, on wheels or even spark plugs, right? Spark plugs are a tight area to have to get into where these work out really well. Yeah, you're not likely to get an impact socket to work on most heads. Yeah, you know, the heads are really True. tight around that. So. Yeah. While we're touching on sockets, though, let's let's talk about how do you identify uh, standard versus metric on your mm -hmm. bolts. Ooh. You know. Yeah. So on each one of these bolts, normally they have a grade on them on the end. Like this one says 10.9, so that's going to be a metric socket. It's a metric grade per that bolt. Now your standard is going to have a little tick marks, and that's going to tell you what grade that is. And that's going to be standard size sockets. Yeah. So that's important when identifying which socket to put on there. And again, a lot of vehicles they're going to use either metric or standard. Now, some vehicles are starting to mix them up a little bit, but if you have a Toyota, right, most of the time you're running metric. Um, very rarely are you gonna find the standard on there. I think the newer Jeeps, they mix it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, they, they have it mixed pretty throughout. It's mostly metric now, believe it or not, but there's still quite a few standard, standard names yeah. on there. So the older identifying. Yeah, older Jeeps, they were all standard, right? Most of your American-made vehicles, they were all standard. Um, but they are starting to mix it up a little bit, so make sure you're carrying the correct size. You can't use a 12 millimeter on a standard socket, right? You're going to round it off. So with you know with sockets in all tools, one thing to think about is you know the quality of the tool that you're buying. So you know when you buy a professional grade tool, you get things like a chamfered edge. So you know what that means is the corners have you know kind of rounded, so they're chamfered. So when you turn the socket, it's not digging into the edge of the bolts it contacts the flats of the bolts. Um, so that's one thing you know, that you see an upgrade when you buy a professional tool. You know, the other thing is warranty. So you, know, you, know, you buy a professional grade tool, you get a lifetime warranty. So you're buying you know, this 13 millimeter socket, you're buying it one time. And if it breaks or cracks or anything, you know, it's, it's covered in warranty. The only thing it won't cover is if you lose it or drop it on the trail, <laughs> I guess. So don't let your buddy borrow. Yeah, don't let your buddies borrow. You know, these are heat treated. They're tempered for strength. Um, you know, these SunX chrome sockets, they're marked. So your red is your SAE, your, met, your metric is blue. Um, these are actually chromed after the etching in the paint. So that chrome doesn't wear off and you don't get any, you know, rust forming. And they just hold up a lot better, a lot longer. Um, and that, that's really nice when you have a bag that, you know, say is, your bag yeah. gets mixed up wheeling. It's nice to be able to identify your socket quickly. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're holding everybody up on the trail. You know, it's it's nice to identify a socket. Very it easy. is. Yeah, especially in the dark, you know, take your take your light and that stands out really well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think the next thing we're going to talk about is torque wrenches, if, yeah. if everybody's ready. Yeah. I, um, and I think this one's really important because I think it's a very overlooked item. Um, definitely, I know most of us can't sit down and say, hey, we carry a torque wrench in our, in our Jeep or Toyota tool bag, but we probably should. And then, you know, this means a lot to me because I see a lot of misuse with torque wrenches. People maybe just don't know about them and don't know how to use them. Um, so I'm excited to kind of share some knowledge on a torque wrench. So we've got a half inch, you know, torque wrench right here. This, uh, this one is rated from 30 to 250 foot pounds. There's also a Newton meter marking on this one. 
Um, you know, the first thing is never to remove a bolt with a torque wrench. This is made for tightening. This is not made for removing. Um, you know, this is a sensitive tool. You always want to store it in a case. Um, we have a case for this one back here. So, you know, if, if this tool is dropped, if it's shaking around a lot, it can throw off that calibration. And that calibration is very important for those torquing reasons, which we'll, we'll kind of demonstrate and talk about. Um, but to show you how this, you know, this is a very simple click type torque wrench. Um, show you how this works. You know, you've got your foot pound setting. You pull down on this collar here and you turn it. So there's 30 to 240 and then one pound increments in between. So I think we want this, what, at 90 foot pounds uh, or 100 for these, for these wheels. Uh, one thing you always want to do is when you store your torque wrench, you want to store it zeroed out. Um, that will help it maintain its calibration and that will help, you know, it last a long time. You do want to get these calibrated yearly. Um, this SunX torque wrench comes with a certificate. Um, so you know it's been calibrated correctly and you can trust what this is doing. Um, I guess some other tips, you know, when you're torquing, click it one time. If you go back and you click it again, it will over torque that bolt slightly. And, uh, you know, that could stretch a thread. It may not cause you a huge problem, but continued, you know, use doing that could damage your stud, which is, you know, mostly we're using these on wheels. Um, Especially on the trail or just doing a tire rotation. Yeah, the house, that's gonna exactly. Be um, so, you know, we, there's an extension on this one so we can, you know, reach these lug nuts on this wheel. That is okay. Like, as long as your extension is in line with the head and the anvil of the torque wrench, that will not cause any problems while you're using it. What about if I choke up on the torque wrench? So you never want to choke up. Good point. So these are designed at this specific length. If you choke up here, it's not going to give you your correct torque setting. Um, you always want to hold right where the handle is. And you can, you know, apply a little bit of support right here if you need to. But, you know, don't grab this head and don't move this head around because it will give you an improper reading. You know, the other thing is, you know, we talk about the extension. You do not want to use a swivel with a torque wrench. There have, you know, there might be a certain time with maybe a coil or a spark plug where you might have had to do that before. Um, yeah. But especially with a wheel lug, you just you need a half inch drive. It's not something that, that you want to do. No. And then, uh, as Mike was saying earlier that, you know, you have some aftermarket wheels. I see it a lot here at the store. Um, even Al himself has a set of wheels that a regular impact socket won't fit. Uh, this right here is a socket that SunX makes mm -hmm. and this sleeve comes off so you can actually get in there and access it easy. So, and, you know, torquing, you can use a chrome socket uh, in most cases, right? You can, yeah, 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 because your torque wrench isn't impacting. Um, well, you know, one other thing while we're talking about a thin wall socket um, that we see a lot is that, you know, people use them for other things. You know, they put them on an impact wrench and they're using them all around the vehicle. With that thin wall socket, you really only want to use that on your wheels. Given they are a lifetime warranty um, and they will get replaced when they break, um, these, you know, they're thin walls, so they're more susceptible to breaking than, you know, this thicker wall impact. But if you break the socket that you need to take, uh, take off your, your lug nuts, exactly. While you're working yeah. on your vehicle, yeah. you're going to be in trouble. It, it, it can be replaced, but not out in the woods. So on this Jeep, we're going to tighten one and show you how it's going. So, Cole, you tighten those lug nuts down right there, right? And, you know, obviously we all know we don't want them to be too loose, but really what's wrong with me just putting as many ugga duggas on that lug nut as I can? So, if you put too many ugga duggas on it, say you're <laughs> on it, it really... Why, 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 what's an ugga dugga? That's, <laughs> that is great units of measurement off-road. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you do over tighten it, say you have a long breaker bar, you're not measuring the force, uh, you will have an instance like this bolt we have here. Uh, you may not be able to see this, but the threads are actually visually stretched. I don't know if, probably can't see it on there, but 
that actually will pull on those threads and it actually changes the dimension of the bolt and actually makes it weaker in there. So that's the main reason. And also you want to make sure that the wheel is tight. You know, say you're running on with the impact uh, air, say your compressor's down or the regulator's messed up. Or you're uh, using, yeah. a, using a cordless, your battery. Yeah, the battery right? could be weak, so. Yeah, so if we continually over torque a lug nut and we stretch those threads, that could lead to like a lug nut falling off or even shearing off those studs? Yeah. Yeah, so now your wheel's coming off even though you have been tightening down your, your lug nuts. So carrying a torque wrench or at least making sure your lug nuts are torqued is a good thing. And I, yeah, I think we had a question about bouncing around off road with a, with a torque wrench. And that's, you know, that's why you want to keep it in your case because the case is designed to take some impact. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to just put this in the tool bag by itself and it yeah. banging around with other wrenches and things like that. I need to make an off road specific. <laughs> that's a great <laughs> idea. I, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Awesome. So recalibration, a question there. So, um, for, you know, say a SunX brand tool, there is on the website, there's a number you can call, you can send it in. Um, there's also a few other resources. There's a few other resources online, some private companies that, that will recalibrate any brand, any make of short wrenches. wrenches. Um, I believe most tool trucks will actually do it for they, you. You know, yeah, that's a good point. They will. Yeah. They have a lot of the tool trucks have a calibration unit on the truck. Um, awesome. And then it is one year or, you know, some people say every 5,000 um, cycles is when you should get it calibrated. So we had a question about torque sticks. Uh, I personally use a torque stick in the shop. Mm. It goes on your impact, but it's still a good idea to still go behind with a torque wrench. Yeah, torque sticks to me are just limiting the torque so you don't over torque the lug nut. And then you can follow that up with a torque wrench to get to that exact correct setting more or less limiting your impact so it doesn't go mm -hmm. too far. And we actually talked a little about this a little bit earlier. Yeah. If you're off-road and you're using a cordless impact, you don't want to use a torque stick, right? You do not want to use a torque stick. It, it doesn't, um, the way that impacting mechanism is set up with a cordless tool, it's not accurate. And you can actually break your cordless tool by using a tor torque stick with the, the way the force deflects on the ball mechanism in a cordless tool. Wow. They're a lot different from an air tool in the way they're how they work, designed yeah. and how they work. Yeah. I never knew that. I've used a torque stick with the cordless impact. <laughs> all right. So all what right. Um, so our next section is lighting. Do you want to get into lighting? Yeah, let's talk about um, lighting. So lighting is exciting. I think there's yeah. a lot of cool things going it's on the there. Right now, they uh, are. It is. <laughs> you know, more than light bars, the better, right? That's so right. You want to see where you're going, so you don't get stuck. Um, so you know, the first thing you hear a lot about with lights is lumens. Um, you kind of get this lumens versus watts. When you know older style lights, you hear wattage. That's you know, the amount of energy where the lumen is the brightness. So that's why, you know, the marketing materials you see for different lights and handheld lights or even lights at your house, you hear lumens is that rating. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't correlate with wattage anymore just because the efficiency of an, of an LED light. So it's something to think about while you're shopping or looking around. Um, you know, this light, is 300 lumen so that you know it's pretty bright i don't want to shine it right at the camera and i'll, I'll blind al over there sorry al um but 300 lumens and you know this one's got three settings so you can dim it down um you know battery life on these things is pretty excellent this with all these new lights we'll go three hours on high probably like six seven hours on low is that right um so, you know, SunX has got a few different styles. We've got 300 up to 1,000 lumen. Um, you know, 1,000 is really bright. And uh, you don't want to shine that in your eyes while you're working for sure. So something to be careful with. You know, this one's got a magnet on it. It has yeah. a rotating clip on it. Um, so something like this is really nice to carry. If you're underneath the vehicle, you can stick it to the frame. Uh, but what I found myself using it at nighttime, I get stuck. I can't necessarily see my winch from a distance or... Uh, it's too dark to see the winch. I will actually put that on my nice steel bumper and shine it down towards the winch so I can see it at nighttime while it's running, how it's spooling back on. So these magnetic lights are invaluable uh, kind of off-road. And because they are LED, they're super bright, super clean light. 
um, and with the battery life on them, that's that's huge. So, you know, the next thing to talk about is IP rating. Um, you know, some of you might see IP ratings, you know, it could be on a light like this. It could be on your light bar, um, could be in your cell phone, could be on your winch controller. So what that means is ingress protection. So that's to do with anything entering the internals of a light. So it's a very important number to pay attention to when you are shopping or you're looking, you know, to make a purchase. So most of your electronic style tools, like multimeters and stuff like that, they're all going to have some type of IP rate. Any, yeah, any, especially any professional grade, it's okay. going to have an IP rate. If it doesn't have one, then most likely it's. Yeah, it's not like you know a, a cordless tool won't have an IP rating because it has a fence built in for the motor. Right. Um, so you're not going to see it there. But anything sealed, anything with a screen, is going to have that rate. Very cool. Um, and to me, that's a that's a very important tool to have in the bag, have it in the vehicle somewhere, even mm -hmm. at home, but. You know, you don't always plan on being on the trail yeah. until dark, but sometimes it does happen. And even if it's during the day and you're under there, you know, tight spots and the skid flake and the drive shaft out. Uh, one like this is important for multiple reasons. You got the magnet that can hold up on the frame under the vehicle. You can tilt it as well to be able to point where you're working. And obviously, you know, being IP68, you know, yeah. if you accidentally hit it and it falls in the water that's below you, that you're having to lay in the train just drive shaft and you need the light to be able to finish it, you know, that's that's an important thing. Yeah, being able to recharge it too, not having to worry yeah. about replacing batteries. Yeah, that's important. SunX and Thompson Four Wheel Centers agreed to give a special price on that light until Christmas. Awesome. 29, 29 dollars that, that light. That's All right, guys. Light. You heard it here, $29.95 for an awesome little uh, light to go in your toolkit. So if you're looking for something to buy the Jeeper or Wheeler in right uh, Christmas for Christmas, list. Christmas present right here. So make sure you check out Clemson Four Wheel Center to do that. You know, one one other thing I thought of when Cole was talking was that that IP rating also works for oil and works for transmission fluid and it works for engine coolant. So all those fluids you're going to, you know, I'd like to say I never dropped See, anything and, in the you know, I'm sure you got big happens. buckets around the things, and I'm sure you've dropped a light. So, yes. um, yeah, Ingress works for any liquid. That's awesome. We're not going to keep it just to water. Um, uh, you know, another thing, just general light knowledge, um, there's different types of LEDs. So this is called a COB LED that's in this light. Um, it's a chip on board. So it's basically a printed LED on a chip. Oh. So just some more general light knowledge there. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and again, you know, professional grade tools, you know, come with a better warranty and they're a better product. So yeah. buy once, cry once, right? There you go. I like that. All right. So next on our list is a jack and jack stands. Now this um, isn't necessarily for everyone on the trail, right? But a lot of us do like to work on our vehicles. Um, Kind of at home so these are some definitely good points and i learned a few things earlier talking about this so really pay attention to this information here so we've got an example here this is a three and a half ton um you know there we, there's aluminum jacks on them on the market there's hybrid jacks um you know for a jeep you know we i tend to prefer a steel jack because it's yep, especially it's, around the house you're right. moving yeah exactly around, so. yeah. This isn't something you're going to carry with you on the trail. Um, you know, steel is just more durable, especially for something bigger. You're lifting to higher heights. It's just a more stable way. Yep. And most, most of your off-road vehicles are obviously going to be higher clearance. So mm -hmm. normally, I wouldn't say all the time, but normally your heavy-duty jacks normally have a higher lifting point. They do. Is that correct? Yes, they do. Um, they're taller than, say, a low-profile jack just because, you know, construction of the of the minimum and maximum yeah what's the load riding on that jack uh, this is three and a half tons um so seven thousand pounds but my um, truck weighs almost eight thousand so right but it I'm does not... yeah so you're never you know you're never using the full capacity of the jack because you're never jacking up the center of your truck you know and jacking up the whole thing at once so yeah think about that when you're buying a jack you yeah, don't yeah, corner weights. Yeah, corner weights, you know, basically take that 8,000 pounds and cut it into quarters. And now you're basically 2,000 pounds on one corner. Awesome. 
So don't go overboard on your jack. Don't buy a thing you don't need. So I don't need a, a twelve thousand pound jack. You do not. All like, right. Well, and, and unless you're really good at balancing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one thing with a jack, you know, to look at this from a safety standpoint, a jack is not meant to support the vehicle. It's a hydraulic cylinder. It's meant to raise the vehicle. So always make sure that you use a jack stand. I'm sure, you know, you know, Cole uses a jack stand every time he, he gets something in the air. Yep. Um, very, very important there. Cannot stress that enough. We want to make sure everybody stays safe when they're working on their rig at home or on the trail. Um, but when you're using something like this, again, just always use a jack stand. Find the right support. Um, maybe you can show show the you know a few options for a lift support. Yeah, knowing your lifting points is a major thing. Uh, once again, each vehicle is different. Um, like on this Jeep, you know, you want to go straight for the frame. It's going to be a little solid point. Uh, you know, if, if you can't get to the frame or it's too high, you can go to the front, lift the axle up, depending on what type of work you're doing. Um, you know, if you're going to do some suspension work and you want it to droop out, you know, your frame position is going to be the best spot. But once again, each vehicle is different. You know, you have a, a unibody car or Cherokee or something, you know, they they don't exactly have a frame, so it's a little different, but they have proper lifting points. And it's important to know that on some of the cars and stuff like that, you know, it, if you lift it in the wrong spot, it'll crush that section of the car, you know, part of the floor and all and that's, that's a bad day. But I can just, a bad day. if I can't reach my frame, I can just stack like some two by fours or something on top of that to lift, right? You do not want to do that again, safety first. Um, make sure you buy a jack that fits the range that, you know, that the, you need to the height of your vehicle. Same thing with your jack stands. You, know, you don't want to buy a jack with a, you know, a 30 inch lift with only a jack stand that has 20 because you want to kind of match your jack stands to your floor jack. Um, and jack stands would come rated as well, correct? They do. Yeah, they come rated as well. So typically they're around the same rating as a jack. And you can, you know, go all the way up to 20, 30 ton jack stands, which are all overkill for, for what we're doing. Yeah. Um, but for the heavy duty guys, we, we do offer that as well. So um, just like guys, we talk about when we talk about recovery, the high lift jack, right? Only using the high lift jack brand because it's rated the way it works. It's correct. Only buying to lift your vehicle, your, your floor jacks and your jack stands. You're going to be working underneath of that vehicle. Make sure you've got them rated correctly. Don't go on the internet and buy them from mikesbasement.com, right? Because you don't know what you're getting. And if you're going to be underneath that vehicle, the last thing you want is for a floor jack to fail while you're under there. So, you know, another good point with a floor jack, you know, why are they on wheels, right? They are not meant to, to dolly a vehicle around. Those wheels are meant, you know, when you're lifting up a vehicle, the, the, the load is centered over the, the center of the jack. So that's why it moves, right? So as you're lifting, the wheels slide under the load. Um, again, that's why you never, you know, you wanna jack up your vehicle on the most even surface as you can. Um, and, you know, even though it's wheels and it's tempting, do not dolly a vehicle on your floor jack. That is not, uh, the wheels are not intended for dollies. We, we do sell a nice set of dollies if you do need to dolly your vehicle around. Um, you know, in, in discussing safety, SunX jacks do meet a safety standard. It's called AMSI PACE. Um, it's basically, you know, equivalent to, you know, your food meeting an FDA standard. Um, so you do want to, you know, something to look for when you're buying a jack. You know, the Mike's Bargain Basement jacks probably <laughs> don't meet that AMSI PACE standard. I'm guessing. They don't. Um, they don't. So, you know, it's that governing, governing body that controls any hydraulic apparatus, basically. That's interesting. One other feature, I'm gonna call it real quick. Yeah, two cylinders, right? So this jack has two cylinders. Um, Mike's Bargain Basement probably have one. Um, what these dual cylinders do, um, one is speed to load. So a lot of jacks, you know, you, you get it up under your vehicle and when you move that handle, you know, you're 15, 20 strokes to get that thing to full height. With this dual piston, the first piston, will move that saddle to the lift height very quickly. And then once it reaches the load is when the second piston takes over. So again, that's just one of the differences that you'll see with a, you know, a professional grade high quality jack.
And that's very helpful when you use a jack a lot. I'm sure Cole, yes, Cole can attest to that. I don't want to sit there and pump yeah. a jack all day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we don't need an arm workout, you know. <laughs> I think that's most of it for jacks, really. That's it. Yeah, that's it for jacks. Um, you know, other things to cover, you know, just in general, you you know, you always want to buy a professional grade tool, whether that be, you know, pliers, just the pair of, you know, vice strip type pliers like this. When you buy a high quality tool, you get hardened steel, you get tempered steel, and uh, most of this you get a lifetime warranty. And I think that's, you know, for me, that's important. I know for Cole, that's important, you know, the tool truck type stuff. Whether it's um, a tool truck or the store or mm -hmm. offline. I, I mean, obviously, electronics and stuff like that, air pneumatic stuff is a different world and warranties. But anything else that's a hard, hardened tool, I, I don't buy anything unless it has a warranty. Yep. Lifetime warranty at that, you know. So, yeah, just with quality tools, you know, paying and you kind of you do get what you pay for. If you guys watch the field expedient repair one where I talked about vice grips, what you can use this for, for squashing down brake lines, things like that. Where are brake lines, right? They're underneath our vehicle. So if I'm driving down the trail and I've had to cut off a brake line and, and clamp it shut with this, well, now this is getting beat all to pieces. Um, so it's going to get beat up pretty hard. If it's not a quality set, one of two things is going to happen. A, it's going to break and it's going to pop open and now my brakes are leaking again or B, it's just going to pop open because it's a cheaper one, um, and now my brakes are leaking again. So again, having a good quality one that locks in place right here, we can kind of see um, how we can close down completely if we wanted to clamp off a soft brake line or even a hard brake line, right? Clamp off a hard brake line with this right here. And if you're clamping on something hard like the hard brake line or maybe even a bolt you're trying to get off that you stripped out because you used the wrong socket, then a good set like this that has a hard tempered steel, then it's not going to mar up the teeth in there and they're going to last a lot longer. So we kind of talked about this toolkit, right? This this Jeepers toolkit or, or Wheeler's well, toolkit. Not just Jeepers. Not just yeah. Jeepers. Toyota's never Toyota break. Guys need some love too, you know. <laughs> Actually, we break a lot. <laughs> just saying. But, uh, but we've got this off-road toolkit. Uh, that that here at Clemson Four Wheel Center, they've kind of started with a recommended list that you should carry. So so kind of what do you throw in there, Cole? Uh, well, first off, you know we've already touched on a torque wrench. You know that's that's a few, but you should definitely carry a socket that will take your tire off because the most most of the time, even if you're not hardcore wheeling, the first thing to happen is you accidentally cut a tire off road. Now you need to have a proper way to take it off. So, Even on road, right? Yeah, on road, off road. I mean, you could be just going to visit your family and have a flat. So, I mean, that's always good etiquette to have something in your vehicle to do that. Yeah, um, and make sure you have that wheel lock, right? Yeah. Some of your some of your wheels now come with a wheel lock on it. Make sure you have that. Nothing's worse than a vehicle comes in the shop and it doesn't have a wheel lock, right? Yes. Then just it gets very expensive. Yeah. Just imagine being on the trail, you know, five miles from pavement and you don't have that wheel lock to change that flat tire. Been there, done that. Ask me how I know. Mm. Okay. So, so does the socket that fits the wheel lock, is that the same size as the lug nut? It depends. Are we talking OE? Because if it's an OE, normally, I have, I have yet to see one, but almost all the time, an OE wheel lock will match the lug. Okay. Now, all of your aftermarket stuff, Half time you'll get a wheel key that it has, you know, like say the metric ones will have a 20 mil, 21 millimeter and won't stack right on top of it be a 19 millimeter. So, you know, it, it depends on, you know, which way you're going. And once again, know your stuff. What do you have? You know, that's, that's. So you might item. need two socks. Uh, OEM, you know, original equipment that came with your vehicle. I'm sorry. Um, you know, so say you buy a Jeep or a Toyota. And they gave you a set of wheel locks from the dealership. They installed them there, or the uh, manufacturer did it. Um, those will normally be, you know, the same. Awesome. So yeah, making sure you carry that that right size for your lug nuts, um, whether it's metric or standard. What else? Um, obviously some some basic uh, pliers. You know, I mean. Vice grips are a good one for, you know, in a pinch for many uses. I mean, we can't even list them all. We don't have time to list them all. But, you know, in a pinch, those are very good ones. 
Um, good settle needle nose. Um, needle uh, nose are great for pulling nose hairs, stuff like that. They mm -hmm. fit in there real good. I'm joking. Uh, yeah, but a, a light, you know, that's that's one of the things for me. If I can't see what I'm doing, you know, it's not going to be very efficient. Yeah. So, um, but you know, having the basic sockets that's going to fit most bolts on your vehicle, because you know, let's face it, we're talking about off-roading. You know, I mean, I see stuff that's not supposed to break, break. You know, I mean, you, you just got to be prepared as you can. But at the same time, the most important thing is you don't want to have too much stuff. Don't carry unnecessary stuff for your vehicle. Uh, weight is a big thing. I'm I'm big on weight savings, so that's something to look at. Yeah, I mean, I keep in other tech nets we've talked about this. Your vehicle has a gross vehicle weight rating, right? And we're all under that, right? No, but we want to stay as close to or under that gross vehicle weight rating for safety on the road. That's what the vehicle is rated on. That's what our brakes are rated for, that type of thing. If we're exceeding it because we're carrying, you know, a whole socket set for standard and metric and we're carrying a whole box set of standard and metric and all these tools and all these different things, plus our camping gear, our dog, our 14 kids and everything else. Now we're overweight, and when we try to stop on the road, our stopping distance is increased because we're over that gross vehicle weight rating, and it becomes a safety factor now, not only for ourselves, but everyone else on the road. So if we can slim that stuff down quite a bit, it makes a huge difference. So what are some, some sockets that normally we never see on vehicles? I mean, you buy, it starts at five millimeter and goes all the way up to 22 millimeter, but yeah. Have you ever really used a nine millimeter socket? Uh, on some dash stuff. You know, I've done a lot of automotive over the years, so you know, you see just about everything. I've seen a twenty five millimeter, so I mean, it, it's oddball stuff. But you do come across it, but um, you know, it's it's not as common. So like twenty five is not as common. Uh, a twenty millimeter is definitely not real common. Uh, nine millimeter. Um, you know, there's quite a few, but you know. Yeah. No. There are some bigger sockets that we need to carry out there yes. um, on our vehicles that we don't normally take, think about because it's not something that we normally fix. But when the event arises, it's super important. Yeah. Uh, For example, like a Toyota and a Jeep, I believe, uh, most of them carry the same size axle shaft nut. Uh, it's normally a 36-ish. Um, some of the newer Toyotas do have a bigger one if it's Tundra. I think they're like a 38. And I believe they come in a 12 point now. Yeah, but uh, you know, don't quote me on that. But uh, a Jeep for sure has a 36 millimeter socket that you know, and that, that thing has a lot of torque on it, and it has a torque spec to go back because it preloads your wheel bearing. Yeah, so that's where your torque wrench comes in again. But having that socket is important. Say you you just broke a simple U joint without that socket, it can be aggravating. You I've done it without taking that loose, but it's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, I have a older style Dana 44 in my Jeep, it takes a special hub socket to get the wheel bearings off, you know, just, just to preload the bearing. So without that socket, you know, I mean, you're taking a chisel to it and messing up your, your spindle nuts. Now I got to buy new spindle nuts. Tools are important. It's important to have the right thing. Once again, know your vehicle. You know, if you have a, a Dana 60, they changed the, the uh, spindle nut socket over the years. So know if you got, you know, the six one or the four one or which one you have. Yeah, yeah. And if if you have questions about these types of things, you know, shops like Clemson Four Wheel Center here, they're a good place to kind of come up with those resources to know those types of answers. So you can call down here and ask, give them the information from your Jeep or bring your Jeep down here um, so that they can kind of tell you, you know, hey, you should have this style nut in this location. And that'll be a huge resource for you. Um, now, outside of like sockets and stuff like that, there are some other things like with Jeeps uh, specifically that we need to carry. Uh, torques, right? Yep. So, uh, like on a, a Wrangler, like a 97 to 06, say you have to do a brake line repair and, you know, the brake line's held onto the frame right there. It's actually got a Torx that holds part of that brake line on. Uh, you can unscrew it from there, but say you need to get the soft line off, soft line off to replace it, you're going to need to take that Torx out because... Yes, you can put it on, but if you're still wheeling the rest of the day, you want to secure that back to the frame so it doesn't cool down and have another problem. So, you know, there there are certain torques throughout the Jeep that, you know, Jeep, yeah. Toyota. I don't think Toyotas have many torques, do they? Not many. I know to bolt the beds down on the newer third gens, they use torques on yeah. those. 
Uh, your rear track bar bracket on a TJ has a torx. It's a T55. Um, the front, sometimes on your track bar, they did a, a weird split on some Wranglers. Uh, it actually has a torx on some of the early stuff. So once again, know your vehicle. Yeah, know your vehicle to put your tool list together. So that's just some common things that we'd want to carry in a toolkit. Um, if you're interested, kind of uh, different types of other things that you carry, you can look back at the first video of this series, uh, the fuel expedient repair portion, and tune in on the next one, which is when, Al? When's our next TechNet? Week after next. Week after next, we are actually going to do some field repairs. We're not going to be in the field. I'll probably be inside my camper with my wife and kids, but we're still going to do some field repairs. We So we're going to show you how to fix a radiator if something happens and things like that. Um, so we've got uh, some questions we're going to bring up here so that we can answer those for you guys um, and see what we come up with. We had a question on where do you get more information on the lights? More information on the lights. Um, you know, Call Clemson Pool Center. They they're the experts. Um, they can tell you, you know, guide you to which one you need. Whether you need an underhood yeah. light, there's a lot of different options. We actually have um, some of these lights in stock here. The they time. do. Yeah, all of them are in I stock. I guess all the new styles are in stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you guys actually have an under the hood, a flood, and a handheld. We do. Awesome. Yep. So uh, the SunX swivel light uh, in stock here at Clemson Four Wheel Center, right? Uh, any info on SunX tools, call Clemson here. They carry the SunX tools, they're local, um, and they do a lot with, actually Cole specifically does a lot with helping them develop the tools here. So they have a great relationship. Even if you are not a mechanic, you know, Al and I kind of laugh about this all the time. Even if you are not a mechanic, you should still carry a good quality toolkit for your vehicle. Because if you break down off-road, there is a good chance that at some point in time, either someone in your trail ride or someone's going to pass by soon that is a good mechanic. And if you have the right tools, they can help you fix it. Or if you got cell service, I hate to say it, but you can YouTube it and at least get it to the point where you can get your vehicle back on the trail. I know Cole's laughing at me right now. You know, some of us are YouTube mechanics out there, but it will at least you get you off the trail, right? Um, so carrying a good quality toolkit is super important. So we're very grateful for SunX to come out. We are super grateful for Clemson Four Wheel Center today for sponsoring and hosting us again. Again, this is the third time they've had us here. So make sure you guys show them some love and support. Visit SunX's social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, all the crazy stuff out there. Like, share, all that cool stuff. Same thing for Clemson Four Wheel Center. So thank you so much for tuning in. Remember. Mom, dad, aunt, uncle, dogs, hairdresser, dentist, doctor, I don't care. Tell them, share. They need to watch these tech nets. They need to know about Southern Four Wheel Drive Association. Become a member if you aren't a member. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you out on the trail.